I want to start this film by telling you what it's not about. It's not about Rangers, it's not about the SFA, and it's not about David Murray. However, they do come into the story, because what this film is about is the last five years in Scottish football. Don't be distracted by this pint. It'll go up and down. That's the magic of film. Not often a football club dies. A founder of the Scottish Football League, winner of a few league titles, played in Europe. In 1967, while the Lisbon Lions were leading one side of the city to glory, not far away, a team went to the wall. R.I.P. Third Lanark. I would say that Third Lanark was the same as Accrington Stanley. Cathkin Park, it was a terrific stadium. The park was huge. Uh, Terraces, the dressing rooms were shocking. But it, the quagmire it, when it was raining, because it was sitting in a bowl, and it just raining, it was a quagmire. But the atmosphere was brilliant the way back then, because it was a Glasgow, a sort of Glasgow derby. The defence was never as sound as the forward line. Oh, the gold machine, Hilly, Harley and Gray. What a fantastic team they were. And it was a big surprise when they went down. You, you couldn't believe how a good side. And all of a sudden just fell apart. It just hit them. It was like a uh, who? Rangers. They didn't realise how big a hole it was in. The ground at Cathkin Park is still there, a testament to greed and greedy bastards. You might remember a game in 1994 when David Murray and Rangers decided to ban Celtic fans from Ibrox. The media were happy to put over the spin that it was because of damage done to seats and all that kind of thing. Mr Murray does not fear a backlash with Celtic refusing to give tickets to Rangers fans. He knows, of course, that Celtic, who are more than £5 million in debt, cannot afford to go without the money generated by Rangers supporters. I went to that game, pretty stupidly it has to be said, and it was one of the most bizarre experiences of my life. As I sat in the main stand that day, in one of the debenture seats at Ibrox, a massive roar went along the stadium, followed by an incredible amount of booing. Initially, I thought it was the Celtic team coming out, but I quick looked into the tunnel and it wasn't. What it actually was, was a plane flying over Ibrox with that fantastic slogan, Hail, hail, the Celts are here. For me, sitting in the main stand that day, seeing that plane, it was incredible, the kind of inspiration and uh, pride it gave me, I guess, that this club that we knew Celtic, that's our life, and had stared at the Brinky bankruptcy only a couple of months before then was still defiant and was still in their faces and was still telling them that we were still going to be here. And of course, the irony is that now they're the ones who are not here. A few of the things we should always remember about the implosion of the Angels is the factors that caused it. One was, of course, greed. David Murray wanting to rule the world at any cost. He was a man that ran Rangers using the bank's money for two decades. 
um, uh, used a number of illegal tax evasion uh, aspects. Rangers have spent a, a great deal of money, you know, stuff to hand, calling Henry's and different guys coming. Again, they just change after change at Rangers, trying to buy it. And to be fair, I thought at certain times there we pushed them, even though we hadn't spent a great deal. You know, you see the statements came across, we'll, for every five we'll spend a tenner, you know, but uh, obviously we don't know where that's coming from or we don't know how they're getting it. You know, so you only focus on, as a player, you're focusing on who you're playing against that game and making sure uh, you come out on top. One of my mates was actually quite high up in one of the two banks. High up enough to be senior, uh, not part of the establishment, but high enough to know what was happening with their accounts. He admitted to me that he couldn't see where the, the, the finances were coming for to pay for everything. Rangers went the exact opposite way to what Celtic did. Celtic tightened the purse strings, Rangers opened them up and blew even more money. The HMRC were going, what are these people doing? What are they really doing? The DPT debt had been served. The letters had been served. The penalties were running. And Rangers went and spent all that money instead of looking after the debt of their company or the health of their company or the health of their club. They just went, ah, oh, we're going to spend more money. The other thing, of course, is cheating. You know, it has to be underlined that cheating was one of the big things that led to their implosion. You know, this unsustainable EBT scheme, this unsustainable bank support, this arrogance of, we're Rangers, we are the people. EBTs are not illegal. How Rangers operated the EBT was illegal. And the only bit that makes it illegal is the side letter. It's the non-disclosure of contractual payments for services. It was a very simple case. It was completely open and shut. They did not disclose all their payments. That is what the issue was. But they had to seem to be beaten Celtic. Everything that they want over, over the period where they were illegally registering players, every one of them should be struck for the record books. Of course they should. Clubs are regularly flown the Scottish Cup. Like, so you, basically, just clubs are slightly more than amateur, but no much, because they make an admin error on their team sheet. Somebody's been suspended for a game. They haven't kept, they haven't kept a letter that says this person's suspended. They play them. They've won 2 nothing in the game. They get a 3 nothing defeat as soon as it comes to light. That's what happens when a player's improperly registered or you've done anything at all. They've done it for like 10 years, they've been this. It's like every single game they played in was illegitimate. The EBT, the side letters, were, were not acknowledged when it came to registering a player. Which means that according to the laws of the game, it's a victory to their team and it's a 3 nothing scoreline. It might have made a, a big difference to who was going to win the league. One thing that I think it would have done it's definitely made a big difference to teams that were relegated. And I think that's, that's one of the huge things that happened in Scottish football. The rules of the game is the only way that we'll ever get justice. And when I say we, I mean all of Scottish football. If you remember towards the end of their life, they put up red card displays and say no to liquidation, say no to Nuco, when it was all far too late. It was entitlement that stopped their fans standing up Hibs had the near extinction event the early 1990s. Celtic had one not too long afterwards. And I think the reaction from supporters to those things was Hibs, we, were like, we knew we weren't getting any favours from anybody. The fans grouped together, decided this is what we've got to do, this is what we've done. Stop, stop the takeover bid and continued. Went to the administration shortly after that, club went into the ownership and we turned around and said, OK, this is what we're doing. Celtic. The supporters started massive boycotts and again, they knew nobody was going to be doing them any favours. Put the club into such a difficult position, their owners, they had to sell to somebody who was going to be better for Celtic. That's what supporters of clubs are supposed to do. They're supposed to take an interest in what the governance of their clubs are. And if something's going wrong, they're supposed to stop it or fix it. If Fergus put a lot of things in place and, and helped the club, but the, the biggest thing is always the fans. Celtic is all about the fans. That was never the attitude for, for Rangers supporters. They turned around and went, this will fix itself out, I'm buying a season ticket. What more am I supposed to do? That's an important factor. 
That probably goes back to the very origins of Celtic and Rangers. We are part of the club. Looking at the other side, it's just that it oh, can't happen to us. We've got too many friends. And we need to fight. We need to fight for that position. But we got that from our grandparents who had been chased out of Ireland. And we're, they were educating us on what, what was going on. It was built into you, you know, the ethos. And that indemnable spirit goes right through Celtic's history and ensures that the fans trust Nabdi and will also stand up for the club. Rangers were born out of an elitist rowing club that had a kind of laced sectarianism thrown into it by a leaf bigot called Bill Struth, who with the employees and workers of Harlan and Wolf entrenched a Protestant superiority within their ethos. It's the rank bigotry that pervades everything about their history and their attitude to life and their supremacist ideology and there is a pervasive anti-Catholicism, anti-Irish ideology within Scottish society and they're, you know, they're not the only part of that but they're a big kind of public poster boy for it. Rangers expected the establishment to come in, save them and everything would be alright because we are the people. A phrase that is even used by Sevco now which proves one thing, they never learn. Rangers' strategy was to go into administration, spin away the debt, leave the club as it was, and start afresh. And they would start from zero, but that's a much better position than they were when they had all the debt and all, everything else with it. HMRC did not cut a deal, quite rightly not cut a deal, because of the EBTs and the precedent HMRC needed to set within the prosecution of uh, EBTs and side letters. This photograph of Craig White in Charlotte Square as David Murray signs over Rangers was never meant for public distribution. It was actually a stage ceremony designed to have a kind of formal handing over of the company. But in reality, this was the moment where Rangers' death warrant was signed. David Murray left Rangers in a hell of a state. They had a colossal debt to the Bank of Scotland, they had a colossal debt to HMRC, and they were on the brink of bankruptcy. This was the point of bringing in Craig White to shoulder all that blame. Craig White was put in to put them into administration. It was an 18-month, two-year job. And when the EBTs were cleaned, when all debts were gone, and Rangers would be a completely debt-free company and David Murray would come back in. But the time it took from when David Murray said Rangers were for sale until they got Craig White, I think it kind of changed. He was running for the hills. Craig White seemed to have some ideas of how he could either get Rangers out of the mess they were in or at least make some money out of it. Um, the fact that Rangers was open for a pound probably made that a lot easier. There is a lot of hero worship for Craig White amongst the Celtic support and other supporters too, primarily because he helped sink Rangers. But the reality is, he is the con man's con man. Yo ho ho, and up we go, what do you know now, nine in a row, bye bye Rangers. Celtic's on the ball again, we're on the way to make it ten. The day Rangers announced they were going into administration, we were actually doing a podcast uh, with the homeboys, myself, David Harper, Joe McKenna and Jason Higgins. And it felt like at those times we were the centre of the universe. In the Celtic world, it was awakening to the fact that Rangers were going out of business. And to be able to commentate live with your comrades about this were incredible times. Good evening and welcome to uh, the Homeboys Lay Party Show, um, where we are uh, going to discuss, I don't know, Inverness game. Inverness game, probably. <laughs> Referees. And of course, the most important news of all. This thing had been in the ether for a while, but when official confirmation comes through, 
and you can actually talk about it and start to reflect on the fact that your mortal enemy is now in its death throes. Incredible. I mean, that's what podcasting is all about. Rangers made a huge miscalculation. They had many opportunities to cut a deal with HMRC. They decided not to. They decided not to speak to the HMRC. They decided to hide lots of information, which was asked for. Within three months of Craig White taking control of the Rangers, he put his plan for liquidation in place. That was always the plan, because there was no alternative. There had to be a patsy, and that was Craig White. But Craig White was willing to take that risk and be that patsy because he knew he'd make money, because that's what he does. He asset strips companies and then he moves on to the next one. And that's exactly what he'd done with Rangers. Project Charlotte was a plan to liquidate Rangers. In effect, what this was, was the key roles that people would play in the liquidation of Rangers. And the key players in this were Craig White, Gary Withy, and Duffin Phelps. Remember, Duffin Phelps had not even been appointed the administrators, yet they were part of the plan as far back as September 2011. So despite what people tell you, he knew about administration way in advance of announcing it. He knew who his administrators would be way in advance of going to court to get them appointed. And that's important because that's the only time Craig White was ever worried in this story. When he had to go to court to get Duff and Phelps appointed as his administrators. As suddenly as it began, the Craig White era ended with an administration auction organised by Duff and Phelps in May 2012. Charles Green agreed to buy the club for £8.5 million if a CVA, an attempt to reach a voluntary agreement with creditors, was agreed. HMRC rejected it, leading to liquidation. Liquidation is finality. Anything when a company goes into liquidation, that is the end. The company number ceases and is known as it's shown as dissolved on the company's house register. Your corporation tax number goes away, your VAT number goes away, your PYE number goes away, then the company ceases to exist. It physically ceases to exist. It is no longer there. Hours after liquidation in June 2012, Charles Green's Sevco Scotland Limited completed their purchase of the business and assets of Rangers FC. It's not a case that Rangers survived liquidation, there's no such thing. Um, the, the Rangers that was founded in 1872, incorporated in 1899, um, the minute they incorporated, the idea of club and company became one and the same. So when the company went under in 2012, so did Rangers. Charles Green and Sevco were quick to capitalise on their new business acquisition. He spotted an opportunity to go, right, there is still value within the Rangers brand and within Rangers, inverted commas, football club. He bought the basket of assets for £5.5 million, immediately revalued them, back up to about £27, £28 million, therefore instantly making a profit. The question now was, what would happen to the team formerly known as Rangers? It seemed like that decision would rest with the Chief Executive of the Scottish FA, Stuart Regan. Stuart Regan is a friend of David Murray's. He was a guy who ran Yorkshire Cricket Club and lost three quarters of a million on a Pakistan versus Australia game. And here was this guy from County Durham was coming up to Scottish football to tell us how to run the game. For the first initial months and years, he wasn't really relevant. But then, of course, summer of 2012 comes and he takes centre stage. So Stuart Regan knew about the demise of Rangers as far back as December 2011. It has been rumoured they actually knew in September, but we can guarantee and confirm that he definitely knew in December 2011 because of the meeting that he took with Craig White and Neil Doncaster, where Craig White and Lyne do exactly what was going to happen to Rangers over the next few months. What did he do? Did he alert the rest of the clubs in Scottish football? No. Did he make any allowances for this or go back on the rules and regulations to help other clubs complete the season? No. What he did was try to put together a package 
that would ensure that by the summer of 2012 the Rangers were facing liquidation and we'd have to become a new co that Scottish football could not do without them. Stuart Reagan enlisted the help of Neil Doncaster to put in motion a plan to enable a new Rangers team to re-enter the Football League in the Championship, the second tier of Scottish football. Neil Doncaster is in charge of the SPL which became the SPFL. In his wisdom, he changed the aspects of the Sky deal which effectively propped up most of the clubs in Scottish football to ensure that any top flight deal had to have a Celtic and Rangers in it. This is exactly the plan that they put forward and was the beginning of their so-called Armageddon. Rangers are a huge institution in Scottish football history and they are where they are. But without Rangers, there is social unrest and a big problem for Scottish society. Perhaps clubs could survive for a short period of time, but it's not that sustainable. So there would be a slow lingering death for the game in Scotland. It would then trickle down in the Football League. There are no winners. There are only losers in this. And it's just a case of how much is going to be lost. We are faced with a situation some say is meltdown and some say is Armageddon. And whichever way you look at it, it's not a healthy future for the game. This is about fundamental change, as without that change in the game, we are going to carry on as we are. The game is broken at the moment and we have to fix it and put foundations in place. He told you and me that because Rangers had died, we were going to die that five clubs would be bankrupt within the first three months and that Celtic in particular would suffer because that's what Armageddon was all about. It was about Neil Doncaster and Stuart Regan telling Celtic supporters, because Rangers have died, you're going to die as well. They weren't promoting the game, they weren't trying to look after the game, they were trying to look after one club. Perhaps if they'd governed the game properly and actually been looking into these things, it wouldn't have happened in the first place. It was like their responsibility is who it was to turn around and be governing again. And they allowed that situation to happen. That's not their place to tell us we need to bow to any rule that they want to break or make. You know, the rules are there, that's the way it is. The SFA would have to have the backing of the, the clubs. The, the clubs were cheated, right? Um, to expect the, the clubs to come back and agree to the, the, the rantings and ravens of Stuart Reagan isn't realistic. To turn around and say that everything was going to fall apart just because of one club, you know, it's, it's ridiculous. And as many other people have said, they only promote one club or they promote this old firm. And if that's all they've got, well, they're not doing a job that they're getting meant to get paid to do. They don't promote the game. Of course, what Shoot Regan and Neil Doncaster for that matter never factored into their master plan was the fans. The fans stood up in summer of 2012 and told the rest of Scottish football, and particularly the football authorities, that they were not going to stand for this. That there would be no new co parachuted into the Scottish Premier League, the Championship. They would have to start, like any new club, at the very bottom. The first game Sefco ever played was against Brecon at Glebe Park in July 2012. They played that game under the name Sevco Scotland Limited. Not the Rangers International Football Club, which they became, but Sevco Scotland Limited. They had to set in motion a transfer of undertakings for protection of employment, or CHUT, in order to register their players over to a new company. The ones that didn't jump ship anyway. And that's how they started life. The fact that the players were able to walk away from nothing is because they were a new club. Because they were an entirely new club, they could have, transfer, they could have transferred over, but they can also walk away. It's like their contracts are no longer valid because that club no longer exists. It was fantastic to see because they all thought that they were going to have an easy ride being down and we don't do walking away just as all their top players walked away. So they didn't have any loyalty to the club. They were there for the money, the money that they should never have had and all their players walked away. 
So to me, it was, it was great. It was great watching. What's important to remember also about Safeco is that many of the men that help take Rangers down are also the ones who are trying to raise Safeco up. Well, Charles Green was one of the people on a long list of charlatans who went into that club with grand ideas and was clearly informed and briefed exactly how to get them on side. He was telling people about his big Yorkshire hands, that he had all this money that he would put into the club and he would get the fans money and get things going. And it wasn't too long before he was wearing an orange strip, being bodyguarded by the UVF as he trolled the pubs and clubs of the North of Ireland and was referring to Celtic as that lot over there. Charles Green told the Safeco fans that he would not be leaving Ibrox until he heard the Champions League music over Ibrox. Well, the only chance of that happening was if Celtic turned up the PA. Alan McCoy's part in New Cole was, was very, very interesting. He's always had that cheeky, chappy image in Scottish football, but as people have got to know him and know what he's all about, that image died pretty much like Rangers did. It was Ali McCoy who empowered Charles Green, and that's when they started buying season tickets again when Ali McCoy backed him up. But when the institutional investors were approached, Ali McCoy's role was very, very pivotal. His wages had went down as he signed on and chipped over to the Nuco. So they framed a three-month period of Nuco, which made it look as though Alan McCoy's wages were a very paltry 200 grand a year. But in reality, that was only a sample of three months. He had taken a wage cut with the Nuco, but as soon as the institutional investors started to put money in, the first thing Alan McCoy did was demand that his salary went back to what it was. And that salary was, at that time, for a manager in the Scottish third division, or in the Scottish second division as they call it now, the highest paid manager in Scotland at 872 grand a year. Good old Ali. If he was the true Rangers man that everybody makes him out to be, you'd expect that the, he would have wanted to have the money in the club as much as possible, but, well, maybe that says a lot more about how McCoy being a true Rangers man than anything else could. So for fans of other clubs, it was a bit like a circus coming to town. People were interested for the new aspect of it and the curiosity aspect of it. But whilst the team was almost unrecognisable from the old co, the fans were still the same. They weren't going to take this opportunity as a new club to eradicate that sectarian element, to try and eradicate all that triumphalism and entitlement and try and create a new identity. They needed that identity on board for the new core to succeed. Why didn't they go back to starting afresh and, and learn their lessons and, and go for the, I don't know, whether some of the gallant pioneers they like to call themselves and all that, you know? They, they just went straight back to the threads of the dead Rangers FC. When they reformed, they had the chance to turn around and say, right, this is what we've got to be as a new club. We've got to be a new club not sectarian, anything like that. And the people who owned them, the people who support them, turned around and went, no, we're not having that. We have to double down on this. We have to double down on what we were previously or otherwise we'll lose a lot of our support, which I think kind of says quite a lot about what their support is. I think my feeling is Rangers, the whole Rangers thing is basically a a scourge of Scottish society. I think they're a rotten institution. They're rotten in a variety of ways. And I think we're better off without them. Other clubs seem to have done well, people turning up and playing. We certainly didn't need the four, four games a season against them. I, I was quite happy. Now, whenever we get the fixture list, it's hearts away is always our first game. And so when we undertook the 2012-13 season, for me it was like a breath of fresh air. Suddenly, the old enemy was gone. Suddenly, we could go and enjoy football without having to put up with this constant hatred that came from anything connected to them. Suddenly, fans of other clubs, who 
who had been told by Stuart Regan that their clubs were on the brink of bankruptcy, flourished. Season ticket sales went up, grounds were packed, fans stood up for their clubs. And so it was good to see a league that wasn't just all about Celtic and Rangers, and it wasn't just all about an arms race between the two Glasgow clubs. Clubs were actually prospering, and this was seen in the amount of trophies that was coming for other clubs. Clubs who had never won anything in years were now realising that they could actually do something in the league because they didn't have to play Celtic and Rangers eight times a season. They just had to deal with Celtic four times a season. So that allowed them to flourish more, allowed them to build confidence and win trophies and make their footprint on Scottish football. The way that clubs could survive is the way that they did survive, which was we turn around and say to their own fans, we need to turn around and we need to support our clubs. We need to support our club and we need people come through the gates. They did. Clubs have survived, thrived and playing football. That's what it's all about. It shouldn't be about we need to have one club and, and that's it, no matter what happens. That's not the way football and life works, you know. While the new co were struggling through the Iron Brew League against opposition like Aaron Athletic and Peterhead, Neil Lennon Celtic won the league and cup. Meanwhile, chaos in the Sevco boardroom saw Charles Green replaced by Craig Mather and then Graham Wallace. The following year, as Ali McCoy's led them to their third tier title, Neil Lennon retained the league once more. It was to be Neil Lennon's final year in charge of the club. Neil Lennon was one of the players who was a combative player, there's no doubt about it. He wore his heart on his sleeve. He was Celtic through and through. He famously said when he first came in that Rangers had been dominant for a while and it's not going to happen on my watch. And that's what we wanted to hear. In the eyes of a lot of people in Scotland, he is seen as the devil. Primarily because he's a successful Irish Catholic who played for Celtic. And that is just the worst thing ever for some people in Scotland. Neil Lennon probably had to give up more than most to become Celtic manager. He came very close to winning the league in his first season, won the Scottish Cup. But as he promised to do, right at the start of his tenure, he brought the thunder back to Celtic. And this was shown uh, the following year where he overturned a 15-point lead the Rangers had into a comfortable title win. And this was the start of the run that we're on now. He put the footprint down that ensured that. Coming second season, um, he then put his footprint on a world where he beat the great Barcelona team who was practically unbeatable at the time. It sent shockwaves around the world and put Celtic back on the map after a few lean years, especially in Europe. And again, a title was won very, very comfortably. And then, of course, he'd done three in a row the following year. And the guy's been abused and threatened and beaten up. We saw live and live on television of him being assaulted at Tynecastle, only for the guy to face no real consequence for it whatsoever. He had bombs sent to him, bullets sent to him at Celtic Park. Somebody tried to murder him. And you start to think, what, what exactly has this guy done wrong? You know, he's a Celtic player, then he became a Celtic coach, then a Celtic manager. I didn't see that as reasons to be sending bombs and bullets. Neil Lennon took a, a kind of lead from Gordon Strachan, who had obviously come into Celtic as a coach there. Strachan believed there was a kind of lifespan for a, a Celtic manager um, of about four or five years. So when Neil Lennon decided he'd had enough, I wasn't really surprised, especially given what Neil Lennon had been through in, in some of those years. I think Neil Lennon may have stepped away at the right time for him. I just love Neil Lennon. I love him. I love, I love everything that he's about. Like, he's a Celtic man, that's it. I was sad to see him go, but you kind of you knew for him it was his time to go. I mean, all the the things that were happening personally with them, it, it couldn't have been a good place. I mean, that's a lot to have on your shoulders as well as ha like managing the, the biggest club in Scotland. 
It's important to remember Neil Lennon's contribution to the league run that we're on right now. And also, more importantly, what he gave up to be Celtic manager in particular, because he basically gave up a life because of the oppression and hatred that he felt. I think it's important that everybody associated with Celtic Football Club salutes Neil Lennon and reminds themselves of just how much a contribution that man's made to this football club. And meanwhile, more boardroom madness saw Graham Wallace replaced as CEO by Mike Ashley's right-hand man, Derek Lambas. What was supposed to have been a three-year journey for the new co took an unexpected twist once they hit the championship. Ali McCoist imploded and was placed on gardening leave and then replaced by Stuart McCall. To watch him fail was great. Like, I'm not going to lie, to watch Ali McCoist fail at his club, the club that he loves, it was fantastic to see. All along the lifetime of uh, Sevco, uh, the stalking horse has been Dave King. And Dave King was always seen as the saviour by Sevco fans because in the early 2000s he put in £20 million to Rangers Old Co because he was minted. South African billionaire and all this kind of stuff. Dave King was never going to be a new gallant pioneer a save core or anything like that. Dave King managed to wrestle control of the club, bring in his own people for a short spell of time and effectively get control of the save core for very, very little. On the promises, of course, of spending his grandchildren's inheritance and his children's inheritance and all this kind of thing and outlining plans to spend 50 million in the transfer market and this amount of money on the infrastructure and this amount of money on the crumbling stadium when in reality, very, very few Rand has actually left his pocket. And that's why we get on to the real reason why he's involved in the first place, because his plan, his only plan, was not about boosting Safeco or pushing them to the top of Scottish football for the first time ever. It was about getting that £20 million back from David Murray. And he felt that putting his profile high in Scotland again would enable him to pursue that. And he continues to do that to this day. And don't take my word for it about his need for money, take the words of his lawyer. When the takeover panel demanded that he take over the club as a whole because of his shares, his lawyer was the one who said he was penniless. One of the interesting things about the differences between Celtic Rangers and now Sevco is the scrutiny that Celtic people put on anybody involved with a football club. We have a lack of trust for boards because of previous regimes. And we have the ability to do that with pretty much anybody in Scottish football. That's why Dave King would never be anywhere near Celtic Football Club. Because if you look at his track record, he's another guy who basically goes into companies, tries to turn them around, makes a fortune on the shares. He was under criminal indictment for tax evasion and various other shady dealings in South Africa. And was called by the South African judge a glib and shameless liar. Now, the bottom line is, that level of scrutiny would ensure that somebody like him would never be allowed to darken the door of Celtic Football Club. But not only was he welcome at Ibrox, the SFA passed him as a fit and proper person to run Sevco. The whole brand is toxic now. Everything around Rangers is toxic. What they have is their own core support. No credible businessman will go anywhere near them now. You know, why not learn a lesson and everybody that's come in, they've lauded them as the next saviour, saviour, saviour. You know, it's, they, they just, they don't want to learn their lesson, they just want, they just want to be back up there. That's where they want to be and they think it's their right and they think they are the people and, and the, Scotland belongs to them and football belongs to them. But, but the, the sad news is for them is that that's long gone. Celtic, meanwhile, invested in new talent with the appointment of Ronnie Dyla, who was seen as a risk worth taking. So the thinking behind employing Ronnie Dyla was thus. He could come in, have a year's grace because there was no Sevco in the league, get to know the league, and would kind of open the door for that type of manager to come into Celtic. Someone who doesn't necessarily have a Celtic background, doesn't necessarily have a Scottish football background, but does actually know what he's doing in terms of coaching and management. 
Ronnie Dyle was he came in as a, a successful manager. He'd, he'd won the league with Strong Gods in, in Norway, which was, was a bit like winning the league with Inverness. I was a big fan of what Dyle had to say. Ronnie spoke a good game. He seemed to find it very hard to put that across to his players, though. For a wee while, it felt like it was the right kind of thing. But like any person coming to Celtic who really doesn't have any kind of Celtic background, the job is enormous. There are so many people relying on you for their mood, for their outlook on life, for their day-to-day -day enjoyment of life, and that's a hard thing to do. You've got the supporters who go to the games, you've got the supporters who are just outside the people going to the games, you've got the supporters who are dotted around the world, you've got the ex-players who write newspaper columns and do punditry. Every single one of them is going to be on your case if you're not performing. At the end of the day, he's going to go down in history as being one of the managers who who helped us get 10 in a row, so Ronnie Dyla was a risk worth taking. Ultimately, we realised that to run a club like Celtic and have such huge responsibility on your shoulders, you need somebody who actually lives and breathes the football club. Finally, the new co, now led by Mark Warburton, made it to the top division for the very first time in their history. Of course, through these so-called banter years, one of the best bits of banter I ever heard was when Dave King told us that because Sevco won in the league, the titles we won were tainted. So I ask you, the viewer, a question. Which set of titles do you think are tainted? The ones that we won fairly and squarely? Or the ones that Rangers won that were gained illegally by cheating? Running parallel to these last five years of mayhem, or the banter years as they call them, has been the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act that was implemented in 2012. This is an oppressive act that has been clearly designed to demonise football supporters, in particular Celtic supporters, but not exclusive to. There was a sort of set to between two managers and thereafter, um, there was on the Monday, there was a summit called we were in the run-up to an election and a couple of weeks before Jack McConnell, who had been the First Minister, was having a go at Alex Salmond saying he dropped the baton on fighting sectarianism. He also had the extremely ambitious and malevolent Stephen House, who was angling for the top job in the soon-to-come combined Scottish Police Force. And he was looking at a period of squeezed budgets and he was looking to have some of the anti-sectarian budget. We formed sometime at the beginning of the 11-12 season, Fans Against Criminalisation, which was originally formed by the five main Celtic supporters groups. Green Brigades, whose initiative it was, Celtic Trust, Celtic Supporters Association, Irish Celtic Supporters Association and the Affiliation. We formed it, but we immediately opened it up and put out a call because we understood that while we thought there were particular reasons for this legislation which was about targeting us, we did understand very clearly that any legislation that was brought in and any powers that were given to the police would be used much more widely than that. We don't have murder fiscals or rape fiscals, or, but we have football fiscals and there are three of them and they divide the country up between them. Uh, and they will quite often attend games and instruct match commanders to to treat a particular chant or something as offensive. And the person who's been offended doesn't have to be there or indeed ever know about it. And in an actual fact, uh, if you look back at the numbers as we do and we monitor them over the years, quite often the victims are police officers. The police know that if you want to target somebody, if somebody's annoying you, if you don't like somebody and, and you can't get them for any legitimate reason, just say what they did was offensive. The fiscals will not back away from it. They never do with football cases. Never. They're not allowed to. The Offensive Behaviour at Football Act gained its first real national exposure uh, in the Kettling of the Green Brigade in March 2013. The police really, really hate the Green Brigade. I don't know why. It's bizarre because when all is said and done, this is a group of football supporters. They're not some crazy sale of uh, you know people trying to take over the state or anything. <laughs> they are a, 
they are political, they have political views, they express the, the, those views as they have every right to do. But the police really, really hit them. I don't think people can underestimate the scale of the operation that was mobilised that day in a planned way. There was helicopters, there was 20, 30 police vans that I saw. Uh, they had been assembled there from early in the morning. They knew what they were doing. They claimed that they, you know, responded to, you know, a call for a member of the public. That is an utter lie. If they had not appeared that day, the corteo or walk, which was in support of people who had been banned from Celtic Park, would have simply walked up the Gala Gate, mingled with the usual football traffic pedestrians and got to Celtic Park and that it would have been unknown to anybody. They unleashed, you know, an, an absolute civil rights abomination on people. They killed people. Uh, and there was old people, there was young children, there was, this was not a band of hardened youth they were rounding up. Not one single conviction for any public order offence, any violence, and this is in circumstances where there were so many police, every second person was a police officer. There was so much video footage of that event, if there had been any violence, if there had been any public order offences, people would have been convicted for it. There was not one single conviction. There is now an absolutely toxic relationship between Police Service of Scotland and football fans, in my opinion. Uh, and particularly among young people, and these are not young people who would normally have much to do with the police, and they now do not trust them. I do not trust them. I'm a middle-aged woman. I don't really need to have much to do with the police, to be honest. I don't trust them. I wouldn't trust them as far as I could spit. This offensive act is due to be repealed. However, we know that you can never trust the establishment. Would it be too hard to believe that the First Minister of Scotland offered to help Rangers with HMRC and get them to cut a deal in return for support for the Offensive Behaviour at Football Act? I wonder how many Rangers supporters or Sevco fans who sat in jail cells and continue to sit in jail cells, know that their club helped enable that. The trial of Craig White was a very interesting one because I've never seen selective amnesia go as far as it did in that court case where nobody could remember anything, nobody could remember a meeting with Craig White, nobody could remember any talk about Rangers being liquidated, going into administration or anything like that. It was almost a Casey Manuel in 40 Towers where people just went up the courtroom and stayed, I know nothing, I know nothing. But what was clear, and what was clear to everybody who had been following the case, was that Craig White was going to be found not guilty. Because Craig White was not guilty. You could feel St David Murray and Robert Smith and such squirming. However much Rangers fans hate him now, or anything like that, he was not guilty. He never done anything wrong. And you could see, you know, that what you believed to be the case for many, many years but could not prove was just plain in sight. It was important for the establishment that they backed away for that court case. It was one of these things where you knew Craig White was going to walk through it because you knew in the background it was those that had started it off and continued and Murray yet again. For someone who followed the career of David Murray for a long time, to see him in court was a thing I'd never thought I'd see. Which shows you the eroding power of people like David Murray, which is definitely a good thing. By the end of the Ronnie Dyla tenure, it was obvious that change was needed and it was after a horrifically poor game against Ross County that the club announced a few days later that Ronnie would be leaving at the end of the season and nothing against Ronnie, he'd done a great job he'd done for us and he won two league titles and a league cup, but ultimately change was needed. There was a kind of thing in the ether that Brendan Rodgers was the man the club wanted. There was talk of Brendan Rodgers and is Brendan Rodgers coming, is he coming to Celtic? It started to gather a bit of sort of momentum as if this is exactly what we need. On the day that Brendan was actually unveiled to the Celtic support, it was one of the probably the most beautiful day I've ever seen in Glasgow. 
It was in the high 70s, beautiful bright sunshine and I'm sure Brendan was delighted for that, for his tan obviously, but the whole day just seemed to fit. I got a text for one of my pals, Brendan Rodgers has just been announced as Celtic manager, I'm thinking, what? really, really? And then we heard that he's going to be announced at Celtic Park, come on up and welcome him. I didn't believe the amount of Celtic fans that were there that day, it was just a sea of green and white. There was a whole load of people there outside the press who were um, just seemed like regular punters. And a wee bit of investigation told me that basically they were Brendan's family. You know, brothers and, and you know, nieces and nephews, all that kind of thing. I thought that was fantastic. So when Ian Jameson, the Celtic PR guy, announced the new manager of the Celtic Football Club, Brendan Rodgers, I looked at them and they all burst into tears and I thought, this is the right guy for this football club. You've got 10,000 people or something turning up just to greet a new manager. Uh, so it did feel like a step up. It felt like a step up, right for day one, right for his arrival when, and I was among the people who went down to, uh, you know, to, to greet him that day. Well, the man's a Celtic supporter. He's, he's, he's understood Celtic, I think, all his days. When he walked out the tunnel there, you knew he was a man and he was going to turn Celtic about and start winning his games, trophies, like, like we should be doing. Everything that he had, Ronnie Dyla didn't have coming into Celtic, which is, which is a big plus. He has a reputation that uh, where money was available, a player might want to uh, sign for him who wouldn't have signed for Ronnie Dyla. Would Moussa Dembele have come to Celtic on the same terms? Had Ronnie been manager? Doubtful. So of course I started to think that they've brought in Brendan Rodgers, they're scared. Scared of what? We've brought in Brendan Rodgers because we can afford to. We can afford to bring in Brendan Rodgers. And he wants to be at the club. He's a Celtic man, he said himself. I think as football supporters, especially in June, July, that's when your optimism's highest because there's no football in. You kind of talk to your friends and your family and your fellow supporters about what do you think we've got to do this season and all that and some people get carried away and say I think we'll win the league on that day and I think we'll get missed many points. But in all my 44 years on the planet I've never ever heard anybody say you know what I think we'll do an invincible treble. But guess what it happened. And it happened because Brendan Rodgers brought a professionalism and a passion to Celtic that had been missing for the club probably since Martin O'Neill. His philosophy is what's made Celtic what they are today. The winning mentality, the no fear, mixed with his team management and his squad building, it's just unbelievable. His ability to change things, his ability to get better um, performances out of players, the fact that he's up to the levels of fitness within the team. you just got a, a great belief that you, know, you can go and do anything now. So the kind of glow that Brendan Rodgers brought to the football club right away just seemed to go on forever. Like any Celtic manager who comes in in a summer, his first task is to try and get us into the Champions League somewhere we hadn't been for a couple of years. And Brendan managed to do that for us, even though the Beersheba game in Israel was probably the worst 90 minutes in my entire life. I felt like I was just coming out of an operation, quite frankly, when I watched that game and the relief was incredible. But we'd done it and we were there and we were back. He had also started a winning run in the league at Tynecastle. We were with both Scott Sinclair. He was signed that morning, put him on the bench, came on, scored the winner that day and we were off and running. There was a lot of players that were still there under the previous managers. You know, I just don't think they bought into the, the, the way maybe Ronnie was trying to play football or he didn't get across well. But Brendan's just came in and just let... He, he's, you've seen a difference in a lot of these same players and you just think, well, why is that? give guys extra belief, uh, particularly Armstrong and McGregor, who've come in and been first class, but to give these boys who at the time were probably on the periphery, they weren't, you know, nailed on first team players, uh, to give them the confidence and the belief to go and express themselves, I think that's, that's down to the management. 
obviously the new players that have come in have, have, have added the same kind of spark in and, and a bit of belief uh, around other players because like you say Sinky's come in and it's just, just lifted everybody I think on the park and everybody off the park as well. Brendan brought in Dembele, Sinclair, class players who are going to add to a, a team there that have already dominated for the, the few years before. But they've brought something back to the team which I think is always Celtic in terms of excitement and the way they've played their football. And I think that's what gets the supporters there, that's what gets the supporters excited. You know, the, the, the style of football they've played. They've steamrolled teams this year at times. I remember the first time we played Safeco and everything was about Joey Barton. It was Joey Barton this, Joey Barton that, Joey's going to do this, Joey's got to do that. And what was really interesting about it is whilst Joey done all his talking on social media, the person that he spoke most about, Scott Brown, never said a word. And then we all seen what happened. Scott Brown completely dominated him and Joey was back off to the bookies down in England. Could you imagine Bobby Murdoch and Davy Hay playing midfield now against some of these hard men? Hey, oh, they'd be screaming. And that was getting tackled in the fair way. From then on in, it was just a procession of victories and, and greatness. We put a stamp on the Champions League with two great games against Man City, who looked previously invincible until we got ahead of them. And bit by bit, you started to realise there's, there's something special happening here. The football that was played, um, the way the fans came together, the celebrations, uh, the 50th anniversary of Lisbon, it's, uh, it was just everything just coming together at the one time. The League Cup run, I thought it was quite a quick process. Before we know it, we're, we're in a semi-final, we're thinking to ourselves, we're going to get a game or two away for our first major trophy before the year's even out. And right enough, we got to the final and remember that day very well to walk out Hamden and see our first major trophy before the years even by. It was magic. I'll always remember the photo online after the game. It was Brendan Rodgers presenting the League Cup to the Celtic fans and I can remember just the, the sheer roar for the Celtic end. Probably the first time that I even thought about going undefeated in the league that season was when we won at Ibrox at Hugmanay, which was a, a good win. We went one down, then Musa smashed one at the net at the Copeland Road end. Silence them. And then Scotty Sinclair get the winner in the second half. 2 1 gone on 5 or 6 1, which you know that we've done that a few times against them as well. But then I started to think, you know what, here's a winter break coming, get the players refreshed, and things might just start to happen. It's the old cliche one game at a time, but I think uh, I think they were talking as far back as December, you know, when Celtic were on this run, could they do it and could they achieve it? And I think if you're a player getting into that kind of run, you don't want to be the guy who makes a mistake for, you know, the slip up or the potential slip up. So I think they just gained confidence game after game uh, and took it right through. I wasn't particularly bothered about having an unbeaten season. I thought other things were more important. But as you got closer to the point where it looked like we were going to have an unbeaten season, then you just really wanted it. I wasn't one of the fans at the start who kept saying, we're going to go unbeaten, we're going to go unbeaten. But it was Inverness away, midweek I can remember it, a freezing cold night. You're wondering if some players were just run and hide. But it took us a while to get started that night, but we went on and we won really comfortably. I was on the car home from Inverness that night thinking, I, I think we, could, we, we can do this. And the closer you got, the tension was absolutely unbearable because you realise this is actually history in the making. We'd won the League Cup in November, had progressed in the Scottish Cup, went to Ibrox and annihilated them. And you start to think, we are getting closer to an invincible treble. All the while in the backdrop of the great Lisbon Lions 50th anniversary and the events that were going around. So every day it felt something Celtic was going on. There was an event, there was something in the news, there was some kind of announcement at Celtic. All the while, they're going to the football matches and Celtics are getting closer and closer and closer 
to what would be, you know, the impossible dream. The last part of the season, it was very nervy. You're getting to that point where you've exceeded expectations and you're thinking to yourself, how is that playing on the players' minds? Celtic just ran riot up and down the country, every competition. Something fans dream of. Good football as well, you know, it's very important that you see good football while winning. It was a pleasure, absolute pleasure. And you knew at the time that we won the league, the season was far from over because we had so much more work to do. Because we knew we had to go through that season and we had the record to get invincibles. And then we went to Partick Thistle when it was three games to go. There was a fantastic display for the Lisbon Lions and front school flags, which were phenomenal. And then the team just blew Partick Thistle off the pitch in a 5 0 win. So then we get to the last game of the season in the league, and it's, this is for the Invincible League season, and the only team I'd ever known that had done that before really was Arsenal in the modern day, but they had never done it with the Cups as well. There was a strange atmosphere over the stadium that day. It was one of the days where it was May, but it was grey and it was kind of overcast. Now we're at half time against Hearts, and you're thinking, Christ, you didn't want it to be Hearts to stop us being Invincibles. And then second half come out, Crossover, bang, Lee Griffiths, 1-0, and you're like, here we go, that's it. It was a kind of relief to do it, because this had occupied my life the whole season, basically. Very similar to the season that we stopped 10 in a row. And then it was all roads lead to Hamden, to the Scottish Cup final, which I'll be honest with you, to this day is the most surreal experience I've had before a football match in my entire life because you're standing on the brink of history. It is because difficult to win at a treble. In fact, the last treble that I played in, we won the league and then we beat the Rangers in the Scottish Cup all within about five weeks. Mentally, it's a strain. It's a strain. There was a lot of pressure put on them I don't think there was pressure put on them by Celtic, pressure put on them by Brendan Rodgers. I think the pressure was by the media. I think when you're playing, you're in a, you're in a little bubble. I think you just got on with your job and the game at hand. You don't, you know, as a, from a personal point of view, I never focused on anything going on outside of my own club. We were close in 95, 96, but that was just the league. Uh, I think we went through the whole season with one defeat, so it's, it's not a, an easy feat. You've been out there and thinking, I've got to do my job, I don't know what they're going to do, you know. They try to upset you, you know. It's, it's, you've got to be strong-minded and willing to do it, you know, just to say, right, come on. You know who you're representing. You know, as Celtic supporters, you read your history, you know your history, and you're proud of your history. But it's something that you didn't really appreciate till years later. But that day, I think the whole support and team and management and directors knew that this was history. I went on the supporters bus that I go on, but went with my dad and my brother, and I honestly can't even begin to describe how that felt. I think I had every single emotion you could possibly experience that day. It was just, it was unbelievable. I've never been so nervous about anything, I don't think, in my entire life. <laughs> it wasn't big because it was our cup final. It wasn't big because it was the treble. It was big because it was the Invincibles. And so I think that kind of showed in our performance for the first 10, 15 minutes, we were a wee bit edgy. Aberdeen scored and you think, oh, oh God, here we go. And I have to say, the thoughts running through my mind at that point was just, didn't know what to see Derek McKenna celebrating. You know, when Aberdeen scored, Oh, what are you worried about? It's only 15 minutes or something. <laughs> but it happens, Armstrong was up the park, bump, a goal. From then on in, it was a kind of ding-dong cup final. But gradually, we were pushing them back, pushing them back. Our superior fitness was really, really shown. But of course, the tension's there because one goal is going to settle this game. That was pretty much my don't do anything stupid. You know, we came this far, we were so close, and it was just, I was thinking, oh my God, are we going to throw this away? Is this, 
Is this ever going to happen? Is this ever going to be ever going to score? And then Carl McGregor makes a mistake. Johnny Hayes goes through, shows a bit of composure, and that's a good night, Vienna. But he doesn't thank God, and we're still in the game. Deep down, I knew we could do it, but just as the time was ticking on during the game. You know, you're getting to 70, 80 minutes and that's when the, the real panic was beginning to kick in. That was probably one of the, that was such a horrible experience, such a horrible feeling. Towards the end of the game, I started to feel better, even though it was still 1-1. And the reason for that was I could see how strong we were physically. And I said to my son James that it doesn't really matter if we go to extra time because we're going to tear them apart in extra time because their legs are gone. You knew you would go to the last minute. You knew you could go into extra time. The players had the belief, they had the fitness, and it was just inevitable. When Tom Rogic picked up that ball and started to move and jink the way he does with the magnetic feet he has, you start physically rising in your seat, and you start moving closer to the edge yet. And all the while you're in the moment, you're captured in that moment. And then as he just takes that one stride right, you're thinking, he's made space here. That was, that was, I was like, this is last chance, let's, let's go for this, let's do this. And you could see it coming. You could, you could actually see it coming and everyone round about, you could see it coming. Well, I was right behind him, the goals, and I seen him get the ball and coming, and I went, and he drifted to the right, and I'm saying, no, no, come on, son, square it. I was actually looking for the, the options he had as he was going forward and I'm looking for players running off him and he kept moving and he was moving away and I thought he's not going in the right direction. And he, he ran through a, a good couple of players and he got into the box. And then before you know it, it's in. And at that point, time freezes. It actually just freezes. And then you realise what's happened and the explosion just hits you. The feeling that I experienced when we scored that goal, I think that will live with me till the day I die. That was just such an amazing feeling. And how he got the ball in, I just stood in it. I can still remember staring and seeing that ball going in and saying, I'd have been fucking crucified for that. Get beat at the near post. And you turn round and kind of look like, oh my God, we've done it. And you go crazy, and I have to say, at that point, I genuinely believed there was five or six minutes to go, and it was only my son saying to me, that's the last kick of the ball. I said, you're kidding me. And they literally, and that was it. And then you just take a look around you, and you see everyone, and you see the emotion. It, it didn't seem real, see, for a split second, it didn't seem real. It honestly didn't seem real. It was, it was a feeling I still can't describe and I still am over, I, I am over it yet, definitely not. I've actually, it's one of the ones where I'm going to look back and think, did we actually do that? It was, it was phenomenal. And just to be able to be there and to witness that with not just my supporters club, but my dad and my brother, there was tears, there was, oh, it was, it was unbelievable. And it's still, even when you think about it now, it, it's just so emotional. It really, really is. I actually seen a lot of people in tears. There was men, women, children, and genuinely in tears that day because we, we'd done it. We'd actually done it. We'd done a domestic treble without getting beat. I stepped forward and I had a look at the pitch. I was sitting quite high up that day, and I got caught in a moment. And the moment was thinking about people that we'd lost, and I'd lost in particular: grandparents, father, mentors like Archie Wright. Charlie Ainsley and I got lost and I could feel the tears on my face for a good three minutes until someone tapped me on the shoulder and said you're right big man and I kind of snapped to it and said aye and then I realised where I was and kind of went to sort of turn to my son and say you know enjoy this appreciate it you know it's not always like this and he was just staring the same way I was in the moment I thought I didn't say a word he understands it and that's, to me, what the Invincible Treble was for. It was for everybody who supported that football club through thick and thin that could be there to share that moment, not just in the pitch or in the stadium, but around the world, watching on TVs, getting up three, four, five, six, seven in the morning every week to watch that football club. That Invincible Treble was for you.
the achievement of the Invincibles was even bigger in respect that we were celebrating the 50th anniversary of Lisbon. The enormity of Lisbon just gets bigger and bigger the further we get away from it in terms of that achievement. For this football club, Celtic Football Club, to do something that in the modern day is probably something that matches the Lisbon Lions was just unbelievable. Considering what this club had gone through, not just in terms of to the brinky bankruptcy or anything like that, but in terms of the systematic cheating it put up with, in terms of the honest mistakes it's put up with, in terms of the laptop loyalty and the bidding of all these people that we've had to put up with, in terms of Stuart Regan telling us about Armageddon and what would happen to our club because of the crimes he's at another club, that's one of the greatest achievements in our club's history. When Stuart Regan done his fire and brimstone Armageddon speech, he was talking to you and me and he was telling you and me that our club was next, overlooking the fact that there was Armageddon that was just for one club. And what's even more important to remember is that five years after he told you you were next and Armageddon was coming, you were invincible. We were invincible. Cheers. Told you it was a magic pint. Stay.